so pleased to introduce Professor Ken Ames to you tonight. I'm going to keep my introduction short, which is difficult given the importance and breadth of Professor Ames' career. Uh, if you want to know more about him, go ahead and check out his extensive website at Portland State. Professor Ames is the current chair of the PSU Anthropology Department, and he's also a recent past president of the Society for American Archaeology. This year, Portland State University named Professor Ames the recipient of the Branford Price Millar Award for Excellence in Scholarship, Instruction, University Service, and Public Service. Now, he launched his career in Idaho, moving from Moscow to Boise, where he acted as an Idaho Highway Archaeologist and taught at Boise State. From that beginning, and with a lot of work in between, he will conclude one phase of his career by retiring from Portland State in June, having raised the stature of Pacific Coast archaeology around the world. One of his colleagues praised him for, quote, linking the details of the local archaeological record with larger discussions, which has put Northwest Coast archaeology on the academic map. His specialties include cultural evolutionary theory, complex societies, hunter-gatherers, and household archaeology, and he has supervised and consulted on digs throughout the Northwest. Now, his publications are extensive, but Ames' book, Peoples of the Northwest Coast, Their Archaeology and Prehistory, is particularly notable as an accessible and engaging synthesis. That we have four or five well-worn copies of this book at the Center for Columbia River History, figured in our decision to name Professor Ames as the 2010 Castles Lecturer. I should also mention that many of his publications are available digitally, again, from his PSU website. CCRH aims to engage the general public with dynamic conversations about the region with scholars of note. Professor Ames embodies the best aspects of the public intellectual. He speaks frequently to public audiences, he has worked closely with the Friends of Capitol at the Capitol Plank House in Ridgefield, Washington, and has developed significant relationships with many of the region's indigenous nations. CCRH staff members have gotten to know Ken over the last couple of years because he has generously offered advice and information to us on a project having to do with the history of the Chinook Nation. We have asked Professor Ames to provide us with a retrospective of sorts of the work he has done, and to give us a snapshot of the state of Pacific Coast archaeology as it currently stands. We are lucky and honored to have Professor Ames speak to us tonight. Please help me welcome him. Like when, like when Sam is giving a presentation, he gets up and he, he tells his lineage, he tells you who he is, he gives you his lineage in this place. And I could say, well, I'm Kenneth M. Ames, I'm the son of Kenneth L. Ames, who's the son of Ira Ames, who's the son of, and by that time we're back in Iowa, and nobody's really going to care. Um, but I always like hearing that. I like hearing that lineage, I like hearing that rootedness. It's, I don't know, I just, I, I, I've heard it before, but I'm always happy to hear it again. So, um, anyway, I, I appreciate people coming. Um, there's this old statement that you know, it takes a village to raise a child, it takes a whole lot of people to do an archaeological project. And so that is simply a list of individuals and institutions that have made this possible. I uh, particularly want to acknowledge the National Endowment for Humanities, who have paid for a lot of the recent work. Uh, these are my colleagues who work with me, my professional colleagues who work with me on a variety of things. You can scan it very quickly. You can see it's Portland State and a whole range of other institutions and other places. These are people whose information directly contributes to what I'm going to say tonight. The point of all this is simply that I'm doing the talking, but there's an enormous amount of work that's gone on by a whole wide array of people. This talk has a table of contents. Basically, it's about our investigation of the fur trade period, archaeological investigation of the fur trade period on the Long Columbia River, period between about 1790 and 1840. Um, and I have to say that I kind of backed into that. I started the excavations of two sites you'll meet in the late 80s. I wasn't thinking about doing fur trade archaeology, I was thinking about doing something else. 
and this has kind of come up and, and grabbed me by the lapels. Um, hence, one of the things in the title of being entangled in the fur trade. And in the table of contents, I want to talk very briefly about how archaeology can contribute somehow to a period that seems to be so recent and is so uh, documented in other ways. Um, introduce the notion of contact, contact, define it, talk about it, critique it very, very briefly, then talk about this notion of entanglement, um, give you a background to the area, and then go through some case studies, try to conclude this, and then go on and talk very briefly at the end this notion of sort of an entangled archaeology, because I thought that entanglement was also a good metaphor. Katie had asked me to talk a bit about the relationship of our archaeologists and Indian people along the lower river, and uh, the idea of using entanglement as a metaphor appealed to me. So you can tell me later. You can tell me later if it worked. Don't tell me if it doesn't work. It's right in that area of the evaluation part. So there is a rich documentary record. The Lewis and Clark Journal, a whole lot of journals that talk about the contact here. Uh, there's also oral, oral history, oral traditions that talk about the contact here. So how can, you know, it's well documented in other ways, so what can archaeology say? There's sort of a, a canard on archaeology in these periods, and it's a very expensive way of telling us things that we already know, or we can find out some other way. And obviously, my goal tonight is to show you that that's not the case, that we've learned a whole variety of things that would be otherwise difficult to find out. Yeah, very important to know. Scattered through here are paintings by uh, a variety of, of Northwest artists. Uh, so I can't see the screen. One of the reasons for showing them is so I can get to look at them large, and I can't. Excuse me, I want to look at that painting. Um, so the notion of contact is a term applied to the sort of face-to-face, -face, first face-to-face -face encounter between Europeans, Euro-Americans, or others, and Native peoples in the Americas or elsewhere, um, and how that coming together worked. And it has a sense to it, one of the critiques of it is it's very sort of monolithic, like the painting behind me, where you have areas occupied by Indian people and areas not, and there's a sharp line, and one is one, and one is not the other. And if you look and meditate on that, on those, on that changing territory, you think, well, what about down here? There's folks down here that aren't representatives, but it's a very clear-cut, very simple kind of almost stereotypic, monolithic approach. And that's probably not the way it was, but that's the way the, the term contact has gotten used. So in terms of archaeology, when archaeologists have studied contact in the past, they were pretty much interested in how Euro-American goods replace native technology. And the notion was the more Euro-American goods the more enculturated folks had, were, or at least they had, they were leaving traditional ways and, and taking on some version of Euro-American uh, life ways. And so what we looked at primarily was the ratio between trade goods and, and traditional goods. Um, and it was all one direction, the sort of passive receipt of stuff from the outside, but not focusing on the on dynamic interplay in any way. So contact here, just very briefly to kind of use the term, may have started as early as the 1600s. Uh, Spanish galleons washing ashore on the coast, bringing a variety of kinds of things in. Material culture flows from the East Coast, maybe up from Mexico, objects showing up. Uh, um, rival of uh, European and American uh, explorers in the 1770s, Captain Cook, we'll come back to him. The initiation of the fur trade itself in the 1780s, uh, discovery of the Columbia in 1792, and the other things you can read. So this is sort of the chronology. I left off the arrival of the horse east of the Cascades in about 1720. Also, crucial to this story, I'm not going to talk to it very much, and the authority on, on, on this history, Robert Boyd is in the audience. So I'm, waiting for Bob to tell me later, oh, you left one out and you got those days long. Uh, but I think this is pretty good uh, history, and it's very important in terms of the rapid, particularly after about 1800, the rapid depopulation of the area. This is a woman with smallpox. Okay, so the fur trade, anthropologists have generally sort of thought of the fur trade as um, contact as leading to more wealth in the area. Not as not as early fur trade period, say from the late 1700s to the 1840s, is not having that much effect besides the diseases. Um, 
but sort of increased wealth. So farther north on the coast, we get potlatching, uh, getting more intensive. Um, intensification of trade, uh, economic production, but all of this within traditional directions. No real big changes until the 1850s or the 1860s. There's another school of thought that has argued that, particularly because of the epidemics, the disruption caused by contact was so great, there was almost no continuity between pre-contact and post-contact. You just can't go from one to the other. And then, more recently, current scholarship uh, has emphasized native participation, role, active engagement with Europeans, with Americans, not as passive recipients, and also the need by scholars to understand continuity. Uh, my colleague, Andrew Martindale at UBC, works with Cosumption, and he's noted in an interesting article that modern Cosumption chiefs don't see any discontinuity between themselves and Cosumption chiefs prior to the arrival of Europeans, though their lives are radically different. And so, there needs to be where this poses an anthropological problem in terms of understanding continuity when you have enormous, at the same time you have what appears to be enormous change. 